we wish to thank you this morning as we gather together in remembrance of Blaine Worthen. Wish to um, uh, we uh, were able to uh, the family was able to have the family prayer with uh, Brother Brad Worthen. We wish to thank Brent Carruth on the organ and Sister Kathy Coppin, who is our chorister. I am Russell Fisher. I am a counselor in, in the Bishop Rick in Plains Ward. And uh, we'll begin by singing the opening song, I Stand All Amazed, hymn 193, after which we'll have the opening prayer offered by Larry Pennod. Our Father in heaven, we gather today as neighbors, friends, and family of Blaine. We're grateful for him, for his life, for the things that we've learned from him. Uh, we're grateful as, as thy children for the plan of salvation, the opportunity that we have to return to thee one day and live as families. We are so thankful this day for those that have traveled uh, from so far away and, uh, and the safety that they've been blessed with. Please bless us throughout this day that thy spirit will be with us. Bless Jeff and Lynn and Brad. With comfort, knowing their, their father's now with their mother and 
preparing things for them. We ask you to please bless those that have taken care of Blaine and watched over him in the past few years. We're grateful for their service and their, their diligence for his neighbors and the kindness they've shown. We ask thy spirit to be with us now. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. The program today will follow the following. Um, first, we'll have a tribute in life sketch by Lynette Penrod, after which Byron McAllister and Kent Wallace will both uh, speak. Following Brother Wallace, we'll have a special musical number, Take Me Home, sung by Emily Hershey and accompanied by Ann Elkins. And then we'll have another speaker, Jeff Worthen. Brother McCullough, or er, Sister, or er, Sister Pamela. Mm -hmm. Thank my sweet husband. He's standing here. I had back surgery a couple weeks ago. I think he doesn't want me to fall over. So, thank you. Blaine Richard Worthen. October 10th, 1936 through November 8th, 2023. Blaine Richard Worthen passed away on November 8th, 2023 at Logan, Utah from causes incident to age. Blaine was 87 years old. Born in Murray, Utah on October 10th, 1936. Blaine was the son of Donovan Hayden Worthen and Grace Middleton Worthen and was the middle of three children. Blaine grew up in Midvale, Utah, where he went to elementary and secondary school and graduated from Jordan High School. His parents were hardworking and God-fearing and taught Blaine those important principles through both example as well as including Blaine in the family construction business. Their support of Blaine's desire to serve a mission helped to begin a foundation of testimony in Christ. Blaine served a mission from 1956 to 1958 for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Australia. After returning, he married Barbara Allen on January 16, 1959 in the Salt Lake Temple. They were blessed with three children, Jeffrey, Lynette, and Bradley. Blaine and his family first lived in Utah where he taught elementary school. I have to uh, just stop here for a moment. My dad um, taught school back when they allowed paddles um, and teachers were able to have them. And so as a child, he would occasionally threaten, never used on me. I, Jeff would test the limits a little bit, but uh, I just was, oh, no way. I was getting that paddle, but it was big and it was thick. And the children, if they got paddled in school back then, they had their names written on the paddle. So that paddle, I think, is what has kept me obedient for a good measure of my growing up years and probably into my adult. Do I need a paddle still? Once in a while. Every now and again. Okay. Um, they then moved to Ohio, where Blaine received a doctorate in educational psychology. Later career opportunities took the family to Colorado and Oregon as Blaine pursued a career as a professor and consultant. They returned to Utah in 1978 so that I could marry my sweetheart. That's not quite in there, but I've always appreciated that. Where Blaine worked as a professor and department head at Utah State University. Blaine enjoyed spending time with Barbara and the children on many rock hounding and sightseeing trips throughout the US and Canada, as well as the British Isles. A capstone trip for the family, including Blaine's children and grandchildren, was an LDS church history tour across the eastern and central United States. It took us three weeks. It was a great bonding opportunity. I think we'll never forget that time. They both shared a passion for genealogy and family history work. Barbara passed away in 2011. <clears throat> Blaine enjoyed various interests throughout his life, including bird watching, lapidary work, landscaping, 
and doing pencil sketches of his children and their families. I thought, thank my dad for leaving a legacy of himself in the artwork that he did. He certainly left a piece of himself behind. Blaine was an accomplished photographer and artist and enjoyed natural photography and painting landscapes and natural scenes and oils. Blaine was an active member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. His church service included various board and state teaching and leadership callings. He especially loved the time he was able to serve in the Logan Temple, as well as time spent working with members in student stakes. Blaine enjoyed helping others to learn the gospel. Blaine was preceded in death by his wife, Barbara. His parents and his sister, Joyce Walker. Blaine is survived by his brother, Gary, his children, Jeffrey Worthen, wife, Julie, Lynette Penrod, husband, Larry Brad Worthen, wife, Angie, all of Caseville. We couldn't get dad to come down. So we never could get him to quite join the fun that we had down there. He loved Logan. He loved the war. He loved Logan Canyon. So we could never get him away. He has grandchildren, Ryan Worthen, wife, Janae, Gilbert, Arizona, Matt Worthen, wife, Lindsay, of Plymouth, Utah, Cammy Hess with Spencer, Mapleton, Utah, Nikki Dyer, Hubby Brett, Salem, Utah, Nicole, it's always funny to see, I don't think of her, it's Nicole, Nikki, um, Dyer, did I already say that one? I did, good job. Um, Angela Hansen, Jesse Wiseman of um, Harriman, Utah, Carrie Thompson, husband Ryan of Saratoga Springs, Utah, Joshua Penrod, wife Cambria of Pasco, Washington, Emily Loftus, and husband Ryan of Sandy, Utah, Taya Hecking, husband Brit Britton of Napa, Idaho, Kate Worthen of Bountiful, Utah, Tori Worthen, of Caseville, Utah, as well as 30 great grandchildren. Family wishes to express their deepest and heartfelt gratitude and appreciation to the people who served the excellent health care professionals who cared for dad during this time, including especially those from comfort care, home care services, ages home care and hospice, and the management and staff at Maple Springs. I particularly want to express we couldn't dock that into coming down to Gaysville. And due to our work, we couldn't be here. Hmm. And so we found angels that helped take care of that around the clock. One of whom we now call each other sis. Because we became sisters. We were so close since we worked together. They were truly angels, every one of those caregivers. The home care and hospice that helped us know how to ease death gently out of this world. And we finally, we couldn't believe it, but we got dad to go to where we knew he would have 24 7 care at Maple Springs. Can't say enough about the wonderful care that he received there. Tender, your tender love and care for our father has been a blessing to him and our family. After my father passed, and I wasn't able to be there due to being just from back surgery, and the boys called me. They were in a FaceTime meet right at the end, but that went so peacefully. 
he just kind of slipped away. And so they called me right after. But after we hung up, I said to Larry, I never wanted for things in my life. I always knew that he was there to help. He taught us suffer lives, made us go to school on our own dime. However, he helped pay for the grandchildren. I'll never understand that. And anyway, he wanted us to be really self-reliant and strong. And yet I always knew it was just a phone call. And then he would move heaven and earth to meet our needs. I am grateful that I have that my father. I truly love him. And my sweet mother. And I'm grateful for the plan of salvation that says we can live together as families. I felt my mother's presence since her passing. I've had a sacred occasion in the temple with her. And I'll forever be grateful to my Savior who makes it possible for us to see them again. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. What a great tribute. Thank you. I feel very honored. I want the family to know be asked to say a few words today. I got to know Blaine probably the best the last two years. And most of that was done by either texting or on the phone. I was not allowed to go into his home except on two occasions when there were emergencies. As on one occasion, we didn't have his code or the garage door even, and the paramedics had to go through a window to even get in to help him back up. But uh, it was successful. He didn't feel like he needed to go to the hospital, and so he didn't, and he was fine. A month later, I got a call from Blaine saying, I have fallen. The caregiver cannot get me up. Can you come and help? Of course, three minutes later, I was there, and the two of us helped him up to his feet, walked him around the edge of the bed, the end of the bed, and carefully helped him kneel down and carefully back into bed, and he was okay again. He thanked me several times for that occasion as well. Back in January, he approached me and said, at Sam's Club, there are some wonderful cinnamon rolls. Is there any chance you could pick up some of those double cinnamon rolls from Sam's Club? I was there, wasn't able to go into his home, but put them on the chair just outside on the porch. And this is his comment. I am still licking my lips from the double decker cinnamon rolls. <laughs> Thank you so much. I let two or three weeks go by and I said, Blaine, is it time for some more cinnamon rolls? He answered, Thank you. Continue your prayers. But because everything else is working so well, our grocery girl has been picking up the cinnamon rolls. No need to bother with that. But rest assured, if something else comes up that I need, I know you're there and I will ask you to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Because of COVID, again, we were not able to visit him that much in the home. 
I asked in, in June, and there, I'm skipping a whole bunch of these. Byron, I am doing okay. Thank you mostly for the comfort care caregivers that are helping me, taking shifts and taking care of my needs. But it's always a great comfort knowing that you are so close and willing to come and help if I need it. I'm skipping some more because of time. Uh, surely appreciate your prayers. I know that's the prime reason that I'm doing well. And now that I've been able September 15th to move into Maple Springs, this was a marvelous opportunity for me as well, where I'd been communicating only by text or phone. I was now able to go into his room in Maple Springs and actually visit with him again see some of his paintings, see uh, just all of the talents that he had. I did help him on a couple occasions to work the remotes. A lot of the TVs today require more than one remote and one's for volume, one's for changing channels and et cetera. But I was more than happy to do that and his caregivers did the same. November 7th, a week ago yesterday, I had a very strong impression that I needed to go see Blaine. I was preparing, and as I was preparing, his caregiver, I'm not going to mention names, there's two, and they're marvelous. His caregiver said, I just want you to know that Blaine's time to leave us is almost here. His family is coming today. Please keep all of them in your prayers. I quickly responded and said I had been prompted to come and see Blaine today and I was getting ready and on my way. She wrote right back, he can't talk, but he can hear you. If you received that prompting, please, please come. And I wrote right back, I go on my way. Lane couldn't talk to me that last time, but I could see in his eyes and I could see uh, by a slight nod, he knew who I was and he was so glad I came. It's mostly my conversation. I told Blaine, I'm here to tell you goodbye. I know it's soon. You're going to be with your beloved wife very soon and other family members. I appreciate knowing you. I know that you are so marvelous. Just over 24 hours later, he was gone. I will miss him greatly. Our dear friend and the former ward member, Mark Carden, made this tribute to Blaine. Blaine was one of the individuals who encouraged Kathy and me to come to Logan, <laughs> leaving an ap academic life in the East. He also helped me secure my academic position at U Utah State University. Blaine was a good man, and he made it easier for me to reach many of my professional goals as I opened the Bear River mental health services. Now, all is now well with him at this stage of his being. What a marvelous tribute. I just want to bear my testimony that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is true. Lane set a marvelous example for everyone else. And if we follow his example and the teachings that we all know, we'll all be able to return to our Father in heaven. He is there and enjoying life again. This I know and say humbly in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Keep going. There we go. Hello, how are you, brothers and sisters? I, uh, listening to Brother McAllister talk about his experience with Blaine, I thought, well, that's, we are kind of bookends. I knew him as a much younger man. Blaine and I spent a lot of time together years ago. Oh, it's not that many. I mean, 20, 15 years ago. And um, we, had, we had interests that were uh, shared. Number one, art. Um, you know, I can't even, I got to stop for a second. I can't even imagine Blaine more than eating a cinnamon roll. <laughs> he figured out the best way, I'm sure, to break it up so that he would get the least mess on his fingers. I know that. Now, if he and I had eaten cinnamon rolls together, I would have gone, <laughs> and he would go, it's, uh, and it was that way with our art. One time he said to me, we were in my studio together. It was too bad we don't have any of his paintings here. You had them in the viewing room. He painted beautiful paintings. And he said to me, I need to loosen up. I need to be more loose. How can I be more loose? And I said, Blaine, you can't. It's just not possible. Uh, I paint pictures like this. He paints them like this. And, um, and I said, you are who you are, and I am who I am. And we might as well just enjoy it. And uh, so we did enjoy talking art. And he had, uh, I remember a show down one, one summer, down at that summer fest. And, and uh, nobody worked any harder getting that thing perfect than Blaine did. We also shared another thing together. I was his a home teacher for several years. And uh, so I knew he and Barbara really well. And Laureen and Barbara and Blaine and I used to go out for dinner on a regular basis and, and enjoy each other's company. And then when they called me to be the state president, I used him. He was a wonderful behind the scenes helper. Actually, it started before that. It was when I was bishop. We had a, I was sitting right here on the stand and a man walked in through the door and sat on the back row. And I looked at him and I thought, I don't know him. And he looks troubled. So before the, when the, as soon as the meeting was over, I ran back, corralled him and brought him into the office. And boy, was he in trouble. And I realized right off the bat, I, I, I'm not going to be able to spend the time with this man to uh, help him unravel his problems. I know just the guy. So I called Blaine on the phone. I said, Blaine, come and, come and see me for a minute. And I told him the situation. And I said, I want you to work with him. See if you can help this brother. And I'll just stay close. And when you need me to step in, I'll step in. But otherwise, you just work with me. Well, Blaine was trained in the, many of the things that was wrong with this young man. Uh, that went on for years. He helped this young man on a daily basis for years and actually helped him become a useful citizen who could actually function and, and uh, uh, be a good citizen in the community. And every time he'd run into trouble, it wasn't to me he'd run, he'd run to Blaine. And Blaine would help him work through his problems. I, I, I look back on that experience now and I can hardly conceive of the dedication, but that wasn't the only, there were several occasions just like that. He was always my go-to in uh, tough situations that I knew would be hard to handle. Now, I'm not gonna take much more time, but I know that Blaine will be waiting for me with a whip in his hand 
if I don't preach the gospel just a little bit at his funeral. Uh, that's why he brought me here. And, um, and I'm going to do that for just a moment. I'm going to read a scripture out of, out of Mosiah. <clears throat> this is King Benjamin speaking to the people. In the, this is in the Book of Mormon, of course. And I'm just going to pick two or three verses. Because I really think they fit Blaine. At least what he taught. Um, and they had viewed themselves in their own carnal state, even less than the dust of the earth. And they all cried aloud with one voice saying, oh, have mercy. I can see Blaine doing that. I don't think he had many faults. I never saw any. And, uh, and he never told me of any. But I just knew that the humble attitude would be, oh, I'm the dust of the earth. I hope the Lord has mercy on me. Have mercy and apply the atoning blood of Christ that we may receive forgiveness of our sins and our hearts may be purified. For we believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who created heaven and earth and all things, who shall come down among the children of men. And it came to pass that after they had spoken these words, the Spirit of the Lord came unto them and they were filled with joy. Now, I don't know exactly what's going on. Uh, I've never been on the other side of the veil to see how it all works. But I do know that right now, Blaine is filled with joy because the concept and the, the beliefs and the things that he always cherished and trusted in spiritually, he is discovering that, oh, it is all just so wonderful. And he says, um, having received a remission of their sins and having peace of conscience because of the exceeding faith which they had in Jesus Christ, who should come according to the words which King Benjamin had spoken unto them. These people had come to, to this great feeling of joy and exuberance because they knew that, that Jesus was the Christ. If that doesn't describe Blaine, I don't know who, what does. Just two more verses. I say unto you, if ye have come to a knowledge of the goodness of God and his matchless power and his wisdom and his patience and his long suffering towards the children of men and also the atonement which has been prepared from the foundation of the world. If you've come to know these things, that thereby salvation might come to him that should put his trust in the Lord and should be diligent in keeping his commandments and continue in the faith even to the end of his life. I mean the life of the mortal body. I say that this is the man who receiveth salvation through the atonement which was prepared from the foundation of the world for all mankind. Whichever were since fall of Adam and who are and who ever shall be even unto the end of the world I read that verse and I thought that's plain I say that this is the man who receiveth salvation through the atonement of Jesus Christ what a blessing I love to blame with all my heart still do look forward to meeting him again in the fairly near future but I'm not too anxious to make it too soon and uh, I bear my testimony that Jesus is the Christ, that what Blaine taught his family about the Lord and Savior is deep and powerful and true. And I say it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I just want to say... Um... I'm going to be singing a song called Take Me Home, My Savior. And Blaine arranged this with Benjamin Lee many years ago. And I worked for him and loved getting to know him. And I know all of your faces because I've seen all the pictures. So I feel like I know you, but you don't know me. Swift to its close. 
Jesus ebbs out life's little day. Earth's joys grow dim, its glories fade away. Oh, now my heart, please heal and shelter me. That through thy mercy I may come now to thee. Jesus, shepherd of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. Now my days on earth have ended, and I lay my mortal by. Guide me home, my Savior, guide me. Now the storms of life are past, safe into my arms enfold me. Oh, receive my soul at last. Lord, thou sought me when a stranger, wandering from the throne of God, and to rescue me from danger, interpose thy precious blood. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. For thy grace I am a debtor, for my sins thus pay the fee. Let that grace now like a feather bind my wandering heart to thee. Beloved Savior, thou hast found me, and through thy love hast healed my soul. Thanks to God, for he has sent thee. Thou canst mend me, make me whole. Please take me to thy holy habitation to dwell with thee, thy image in my heart. So I may bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then, then that day when freed from sin, safely home by thy good grace, clothed then in white blood washed linen, let me see thy glorious face. Thanks to the Lord, death cannot hold me, for it has captured but my clay. And my spirit, by thy power, will reclaim it one bright day. Come, my Lord, no longer tarry. Take my ransom soul away. Let that mercy lift and carry me to realms of endless day. O oh Lord, my God. Safely home, my Savior, take me. Please redeem my 
my soul at last. Please, Lord, my God, oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to I appreciate everybody being here today. And it's an honor to be able to share some thoughts and feelings about our father. Um, <clears throat> when I decided and was deciding what I wanted to talk about, I asked my brother and sister to share some thoughts with me, which they have. And I'll share some of those. And I thought, thought to myself, what are the things that have been imprinted upon me in some way by my dad? What are the things that I have learned from him through his experiences, through him teaching me, whatever it might be? I want to start out with protection. I want to tell you the story of the Tonka truck. When I was uh, living in Ohio, my dad bought me this big Awesome. My parents bought me this big, awesome Tonka truck, this yellow Tonka truck. We've since bought them for our kids and our grandkids have them. And uh, like a buddy of mine stole it. He stole my Tonka truck. And I came home and I told my dad, I said, so-and-so, and I can't even remember the kid's name, so-and-so stole my Tonka truck. And dad could see the kid kind of winding up the hill with the Tonka truck, driving it back to his house. I've never seen a guy move as fast as my dad did, to go grab and rescue the Tonka truck and protect me from, uh, from this uh, uh, debauched kid who was stealing my toy. And uh, it was a lesson to me. And he, he did that various, various times. Not, he always did it appropriately. But he went quickly to a protective mode with any of his children. And we always knew, as my sister shared her feelings, but she always, always knew that dad would be there. Uh, for her, for any of us, any time, day or night. Uh, I remember uh, I got uh, was on a date one time uh, in kind of a seedy part of Portland, Oregon, where we grew up. And I took this date to the spaghetti factory, which was in a, it's an awesome restaurant, but kind of a bad part of town. And uh, I, I put $2 into the parking thing, thinking that they'd think I paid, and walked into the restaurant and didn't think anything more of it. Came back out and we could not find my car. And we turned around and uh, written on the wall in, in just bold, bright white letters. If you've been towed, please call such and such. So I left my dad outside the phone booth back when there were phone booths. And who did I call? I called my dad. And he was there and $208 later and a ride home uh, uh, with, uh, with dad and my date. I think that was the last date maybe that I ever had with her. Uh, <laughs> Dad, Dad came and, and, and protected me yet again. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. He was always protective of his children. One of the things that I'm really grateful to my dad for is teaching me how to work. I detested it when it started. I hated it. When my friends were going skiing on a Saturday, where was I? working in the yard for at least six hours on a Saturday. When my friends went to Hawaii for breaks, spring breaks or Disneyland, where was I? In the yard, working. And when I was young, I didn't understand. It was only when I started my career and I looked back at what he had taught me, I realized he wasn't trying to be cruel. He wasn't trying to be mean. He was trying to teach me a valuable lesson which to this day continues to bless my life. He was tireless. He would go, you'd start at, you know, seven or eight o'clock and you'd keep working. And, and I'm, 
you know, kind of like my stomach is, you know, by 10, I'm hungry. By noon, I'm like dying. And, and dad would keep going. And, and Brad and Lynn will remember this. He kept going and going and going. Finally, you'd have to, dad, we're going to have lunch anytime this year. Okay. You know, it'd be great to eat something. And finally, you know, he'd say, yeah, I'll go outside and get something to eat. He may or may not join me, you know, but he'd just keep working. He was tireless, but he, but he taught us, taught us how to work. And I'm grateful for that blessing. It's been a great blessing in my life. Then mentioned a little bit about uh, the arts. Dad was an incredible artist. He loved nature. And uh, uh, he shared his love of painting uh, with, with Lynn, others in the family, with my wife. Uh, and he was just an incredible artist. Um, none of that passed on to Brad and I, I'm afraid to say. I don't think we've got any artistic talent, at least I don't. Uh, he loved photography. That was, that was something that was special to him. But what I learned to appreciate most from my dad was interesting enough on rock hunting trips, which initially, again, I detested. And I still look back on some of those and I think, what was the reason again for going out in the middle of South Dakota and picking up little stones to see which ones shine? But there, were, in addition to spending time with family, I learned to love, I'm going to call it desolation, for lack of a better term. I learned to love being out in the middle of nowhere and enjoying that beautiful peacefulness. And I look back on it now. And I, tre and I treasure uh, some of those moments. They were beautiful. I learned to love God's creations as a result of that. In particular, uh, I think dad and I, although we didn't as much share it together, we, we both loved music. Different kinds of music, I must confess. Uh, one time when I was young, probably 16, 17, he uh, confiscated two thirds of my records, my vinyl LPs. Uh, thinking that they were not appropriate and they probably weren't but uh, I found where they were and uh, grabbed them back and realized that even though we had different taste in music we both loved music and he really did love love good music one of the things I'm grateful for is the times that mom and dad and our families would go to the Oregon coast I can think of nothing that I like better that brings me more peace than to walk along the coast which dad loved to do. He loved that, that piece of earth immensely. And it was a wonderful, wonderful thing that he taught all of us. Dad was a, a man of many interests and he was always trying to figure out, kind of to learn new things. Um, we have a letter that he typed recently and it's, it's the most interesting piece of gibberish that he's just, he's just jabbering back and forth with a friend. And it's really almost like an email. And uh, he talks about his typing skills in particular. When he started learning how to type, it was pathetic. It was really, really hard to watch and it took forever. But he finally got to the point where he could get anywhere between 60 and 70 words a minute. And, uh, and the way he'd calculate that is by looking at his second hand. I'm not sure how he's doing that while he's typing, but that's how he you know, basically kept track of his typing. But he did learn to type. He learned to text. I remember when he got his first cell phone. And we helped him help set him up with his cell phone. And he had to learn how to text message and all of that. And uh, he became actually pretty okay at it. And he would in particular use dictation. That was for him how he operated. And that was for him a, a, a great blessing. And he continued to learn. Um, when we moved to, to Utah, we lived in Nibley, out in the south end of the valley. And and Brad uh, tells an awesome story of, of a fruit orchard that dad had planted. And, uh, and dad wanted to learn everything about fruit trees. And one of the things he learned was that there were these little bugs called borers and they would bore into the, into the trunk of the tree. And uh, dad apparently learned more about borers and learned that they were apparently active at night. So Brad, Brad and dad, dad, I guess, and Brad was the executor of the attack plan came up with an attack plan for the borers. And Brad would go out at night with a syringe and would find where the little holes were in the trunk and then would proceed to inject poison into that particular part of the tree very specifically so that the borers were, were nuked. I don't know how it ever worked out, Brad, but uh, hopefully it worked out well. <laughs> so one of the things that uh, dad did is he planned a lot. 
I was teasing the bishop when we were meeting with the bishop. I said, Bishop, I want you to know that we've taken dad's 14 hour planned funeral and we've got it down to about an hour. Okay. Uh, but he made it easy for us. We had a, we had a few little lists of things that he wanted. And, uh, you know, it was kind of like, uh, you know, almost, uh, almost going to a restaurant and being a really nice restaurant, being able to pick off that list of things that would make the most sense. And he had it all planned. Lynn mentioned the church history, church in American history tour that we went on, which for us was an awesome time to be together as a family. Dad planned, uh, dad and mom planned it all. Mom was kind of the, the idea behind it. And dad was the executor of, of the whole thing. Dad had an entire, this was back when he didn't have GPSs and cars. This is the late nineties. He had a, had the AAA basically print an entire map book of every street where we would go and the directions and everything. And uh, I was okay with that until we got to, to New York city. And, uh, and, and the map had us driving through some relatively dangerous parts of New York city. I told dad, I said, uh, your planning ain't working out so hot here, you know? And he just, he just, we kind of chuckled and I gave him some heck for that. You know, and I said, I'm not driving there. So we found a different way to drive out of New York City. But every piece of that vacation went flawlessly because he planned. And that's what he did. Uh, he planned. And, and I think that was, that was one of his hallmarks. One of the things that I think he did well is to, to try to touch others. He did it in so many different ways that people don't understand. I, I over the last few days, have had people reach out to me and tell me that they are so grateful for how he touched them and what they did. Kent mentioned uh, a way in which dad touched people. Dad, dad was a, a professional psychologist and as such uh, could help people in ways that other people could not. And I appreciate that. And I think we will continue to hear about places and things and people that he touched that we just probably don't know about. There are no perfect parents. And there are no perfect children. But there are plenty of perfect moments along the way. One of the, one of the things that I learned from my dad is to keep trying, no matter what happens. Mistakes get made, and people make them. But the gifts of perseverance and the gifts of, keep, of, of keeping trying are the keys. Dad would try some things, and in some cases, they wouldn't work out so hot, and, and, and he'd recognize it. And, and you might not hear anything for a bit, and then all of a sudden, you try something new, try something different. And, and if that didn't work, then he'd try something different again. He kept, he kept trying. President Nelson said, you see, we're all on a journey. Dads are a little farther down the road, but none of us has yet arrived at our final destination. We are all in the process of becoming who we will one day E. And I give my dad a lot of credit for trying, and he continued to try throughout his life to be an awesome father. I'm grateful for what he was. Uh, the quote that I loved as I was looking at quotes about being fathers is, being a great father is like shaving. No matter how good you shaved today, you have to do it again tomorrow. And uh, uh, only half of you will understand that, but nonetheless. Uh, it's, it is what it is. And dad did keep trying. And I appreciate his effort. Lastly, dad is responsible for planting seeds in each one of us three kids relative to the gospel and the Savior. My belief started with my mom and dad. It was just that simple. It took us to church. Lynn mentioned this in what she wrote me. They took us to church. They helped us to just understand that this is, this is what we believe. We want to teach you about it. But that seed planted became something more in each one of us. So planting that seed was absolutely incredible. Uh, in First Nephi, Nephi starts out the Book of Mormon, and I'm going to paraphrase it a titch differently. I, Jeff... Lynn and Brad, having been born of goodly parents. Therefore, we have been taught somewhat in all the learning of our father. I'm grateful for that. It's a quote I found 
as I was preparing for this that I loved. It says, our parents cast long shadows over our lives. When we grow up, we imagine that we can walk into the sun free of them. How many of us, when we were growing up, wanted to be independent? We wanted to be our own people. I think all of us did. We don't realize until it's too late. We have no choice in the matter. They are always ahead of us. We carry them, we carry them within us all our lives in the shape of our face, the way we walk, the sound of our voice, our skin, our hair, our hands, our heart. We try our lives to separate ourselves from them. And only when they are past do we find that we are indivisible. We go to expect that our parents, like the weather, will always be with us. And the beauty of the gospel is that they can be. Then they go from this life, leaving a mark like a handprint on glass or a wet kiss on a rainy day. And with their, with their death, we are no longer children. We have become parents. I have a picture in my mind. My, my dad was a fixer and he, he couldn't stop fixing stuff. It's just what he did. He wanted to fix relationships. He wanted to fix people. He wanted to fix anything that he could touch. And the impossibility of that is that you ultimately can't fix everything. But there's one individual who can. That's Jesus Christ. And I have a picture in my mind of dad kneeling in front of the Savior with cuts and scrapes and dirt and tears in his clothing and everything else and things that he's tried to patch or tried to scrape off or tried to, to fix. <laughs> no matter what you do, you can't. But he knew that the Savior could. And ultimately, the wrongs in this life will be forgotten. They'll be mended. They'll go away through what the Savior did for us. I know that will be the case with my dad and that he'll be able to stand and does stand pure and clean there and that we'll each be able to do that if we do our part as well. I'm grateful for my father, grateful for what I've learned from him and I look forward to being able to build and continue our relationship anew in the hereafter. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Wish to thank all who are part of the planning, the execution, and, and bringing in the spirit and memories in this meeting, this gathering. I'll have the opportunity to share a few remarks. Following my remarks, we'll have the closing song, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, which is found on the back of the program. Following this song, we'll have a closing prayer by Angie Worthen. Please remain in your seats following the closing prayers. We invite the pallbearers to the front. Well, um, so more and more in my life, I've find myself in a position where I feel inexperienced, an imposter pretending to proffer sage advice without that requisite life experience that many would say, call wise. And while I'm still not to that level of wise, I, I am able to speak at this time because of the calling which has been given to me, as Mormon said, by the grace of God the Father, as one who's had experience, who's lost, lost those who, who I love, who, have been close, who are close to me today, my friends, and my family, my mother, nearly all my grandparents, except one indomitable Italian grandmother. All these have gone before me and have entered into the rest of the Lord. And I can speak as one whose testimony, though it may ebb and flow with the vicissitudes of life, rests his hope and faith in the life after. His hope has grown brighter and brighter in their expectation of that joyous return to the perfect day when we'll all be reunited with those we love and who have walked through. As the scriptures say, the transcendent beauty of the gates which, through which the heirs of that kingdom will enter, wherein I believe Blaine, and he never seemed to want me to call him Brother Worthen, has joined with those who have departed this mortal life. 
firm in the hope of a glorious resurrection through the grace of God the Father and his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, and are now filled with joy and gladness. <clears throat> I know through sacred personal experiences in which I felt the influence, the guidance, the closeness of ministering angels who walk with me in sacred spaces in our temples, in my home, in my low points, in my times of quiet reflection. Russell M. Nelson wrote nearly three decades ago that the gateway of death may not be governed by a door as heavy and shut as it seems. It may be softly veiled by a billy curtain or a delicate drape. And I know this delicate drape in which Blaine has walked through is the end to a few things. It's the end of pain, of sickness and aging, of personal conversations and phone calls and texts. But it's not the end of Blaine. It's not the end of his concern for or his watch care over those who he loves and who loves him and miss him. And it is a sweet, sweet reunion with Barbara, who we got to know through his memories. It's a sweet reunion for all of his family for whom he worked so diligently as one of the saviors on Mount Zion. My, my wife reminded me of one of these sacred moments that Lynn also shared that Blaine was able to share with us one day when we went to the temple at his invitation. We had dinner with him and, and I'm gonna quote my wife here and she writes, when we were there, he shared his profound love of and reverence for the temple. He dedicated so much of his time and efforts in preserving family history and in doing genealogical research. Eternal family bonds were among his greatest interest. He seemed to have equal respect for the importance of diligent work and the assurance of divine assistance when our efforts get stalled. I know he testified often of those eternal bonds that endure. And over the seven and a half years that we've lived close to Blaine, we have grown to care for him. We loved having him in our home and in our lives, loved to share his love of beauty and rocks and histories and Australian basketball and wool sweaters loved his kindness to our children, most of all his great and enduring testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was committed up to his final days in service to our God, having fought a good fight, having kept the faith, wherein we are promised that henceforth there is laid up a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give unto all of them also that love his appearing. I know this is true. I know that each of us is given through the grace of Christ because of his atonement and resurrection, the strength to have hope to be raised into life eternal. And I know that Blaine has walked through those gates in preparation for each of you as one who loves you. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you. 
Our dear Father in heaven, we're so thankful that we could be here today. We're thankful for all the many people who helped make this beautiful service happen. Thankful for the kind words and for the beautiful music. Thankful for the love and support that we've felt as a family. And we're grateful for the special spirit that we've had here today. We pray that it'll stay with us to continue to comfort, to guide us, and fill us with peace. We're so very thankful for Lane and for the blessing that it is to have him in our lives. Thankful for his goodness, his love and support for each of us. Thankful for all the things that he's done to help make us better people. We're grateful for the plan of salvation and for the gospel that brings us comfort and peace in knowing that we will see him again. We pray a blessing of safety as we travel to the cemetery that we'll be able to do so safely and able to continue to have a blessed day. We're grateful again for all that we've been given, and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.